pencils, glue. We got crayons every hue. School supplies for your whole crew. Target's got everything you need to ready, set, go back to school. Blog Talk Radio. Well, first of all, I've been sick for five days. Then I try calling into my own show, and they won't let me call in. Yay! Okay, so I'm going to try not to do all my usual antics. If you're listening to me now, you already know that I don't sound like myself. I've literally, and I mean literally, have been whispering for the last 24 hours just to save my voice, just to do this show. So I'll try to make it quick so we can get Russ on the line because I know he's holding. Um, obviously, we're having Russ Emanuel today on the show, 1 o'clock Central Standard Time. Reminder to everyone tomorrow, Jennifer Benson is going to be on the show with events. If, if I could pronounce it right, it almost looks like Evanescence, but it's not. Um, <laughs> and frankly, let's just not try to pronounce it. Let's save that for tomorrow, shall we? Jennifer Benson tomorrow, 2 o'clock Central Standard Time. And Mars Robards, the director slash DJ, will be on the show Thursday at noon Central Standard Time. So without further ado, we're going to get Russ on the line. We're going to start talking about all his various projects. I'm so excited. This guy is, I'm telling you, he's a book of knowledge. So I'm excited to introduce my audience to him. Hi, Russ. Hey, how you doing? Hi. Um, if you've been listening to my babble, you know that I'm, <laughs> I couldn't call into my show. I was trying, I saw you holding and I was trying to call in and they wouldn't let me go through. So here I am. Here we yeah. are. So yeah, it's a well, pleasure to meet you. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to try to do my best here. As I mentioned to my audience, I literally have not been talking for 24 hours just so I could talk on the show. Um, I've been kind of whispering my way through everything and I have this awful cold, so forgive me. I'm going to try to, um, to do as best as I can with what I have to work with here. Um, Are you okay? So I want to, well, I'm, you know, I've been sick since Friday and now it's on the tail end, but the problem is when you do radio, um, a sore throat slash losing your voice is probably not a good idea. (laughs) It's just not, you know, so I've tried everything and I'm frustrated and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to whisper the whole time. And then when I go on radio, I'll talk and then I'll whisper again for the next 24 hours and hopefully by Friday will be good. But thank you. Um, yeah, I think we're going to be fine because um, there's so much to talk to you about. I'm so excited. I want to talk about, though, let's start off with talking about something simple. I, I know that you grew up, a portion of your time was spent growing up in Japan. I've never yes. been out of the country except to go to Jamaica. So I want to talk a bit about your um, the Japanese side of you, if you will. I want to talk about how um, culture and the arts and diversity as it relates to that. How is it in a country like Japan versus coming to the United States? Um, is there more wealth of opportunity there? Talk to me a little bit about the culturistic part of Japan, if you would. Oh, sure. Um, it's, uh, it's a very different culture. <laughs> um, <laughs> I you bet. Know, it's, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a more homogenous society, um, you know, pretty much like everybody's Japanese for the most part. Uh, here it's more, I guess, international. In the sense, mm-hmm. cosmopolitan is that I guess would be the right term. Different ethnicities. I gotcha. Um, <laughs> over there, um, and what can I what can I say? I mean, it's a, it's a very beautiful culture. Um, everybody is. It's a very uh, polite culture. Um, it's a very uh, for a homogen, homogenous society. It's also very diverse too, in the sense that uh, you could have a like a, the, the very technological kind of side of Japan, like Tokyo, if you go there, it's kind of like mm-hmm. that, you know, very like high tech, electronic, um, but you could also go to a city like Kyoto, and it's very, um, it's very historical, very cultural, um, and um, if you've ever seen the film like Memoirs of a Geisha, it's sort of like that, Yeah, you know? it's just very serene it's very calm or if you see uh the preview for that new film ghost in the shell that could be tokyo you know i mean it or um wow. you know even like blade runner <laughs> i mean i it just you know it, it's uh like a, a a dichotomy in a sense you know kind of like mm-hmm. occupants you know the film that i just did it's like a dichotomy there you have a real couple and a parallel couple well same thing here you know you have two sides of japan um and i think it's very fascinating um, because I, I toured Japan, um, you know, I, I backpacked all over Japan, and uh, it's, it's just, um, there's just so much to see. It's very beautiful. I, I had a fascination for castles, so I try to see all the castles. <laughs> I, I probably oh, didn't nice. catch all, but I, I did see quite a few. 
Um, this is when I was like 20, you know, uh, oh, you, sure. you know how sure. people back in Europe, I'm like, okay, let's backpack in Japan because I happen to be over there for one year studying abroad and I'm going, I'm going to do it. So mm-hmm. that's what I did. That's awesome. That's yeah, cool. And I'm half now, Japanese. I'm half, well, I'm half Japanese, by the way, and I'm half white. And my white side is, you know, um, we were here before the Revolutionary War in the United States. Okay. And then my Japanese, they're all from Japan. So, you know, I, for me, I have that juxtaposition, if you will, too, you know. <laughs> sure. No, I totally yeah. get what you're talking about. I was curious the minute I saw that. I was like, I wonder if you have. Now, to the best of my knowledge, you've never shot anything in Japan, have you? Or you haven't done a short or anything of that nature in Japan directly? Or would you? I guess that was my key question was, it seemed logical to me that you would go there and you would actually shoot something because it looks beautiful just from a bird's eye view. Meaning, I've never been there, obviously. It's just kind of peaking. Uh, it's a very beautiful um, country. I would love to shoot there. Of course, there's logistics. I did shoot my student film when I was uh, studying in Japan. I um, uh, From 8th grade to 12th grade, I was um, uh, at a school called Canadian Academy um, okay. in uh, Kobe, Kobe, Japan. So for my senior project, I did a Star Trek fan film, if you will. Um, and uh, it seems, I mean, by retrospect, now it, it seems it's not a very good film. But I guess it was good enough to get into the, uh, the U.S. Cinema program, um, the University mm-hmm. of Southern California cinema program. So um, I did shoot something, and that would be that Star Trek fan film. I shot that in Japan. Um, now, for a professional okay. film, I would love to shoot in Japan. Of course, it's all about logistics and uh, money. Right, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah. That's the other thing. It always makes that go around, especially when you're shooting in a location like that. Oh, my God, I can only imagine the expense. But it's a nice thought. I thought to myself, you know what? That would be totally, totally cool. Obviously, you know what I mean? It would. Um, yeah, okay, it so, would definitely so, be. So since you brought it up, let's talk a bit about that film you were mentioning, Star Trek Hidden Identities, because I thought that that was neat. Um, I'm not a Trekkie myself, so first of all, I often wonder, I'm like, I don't know why the hell people even want to do anything about Star Trek, because I just don't get it. But I was like, okay, so talk to me a little bit about the film and the driving motivation behind that, meaning were you a fan? Was this something that um, just tell me the synopsis of the story first, because most people that are listening and have obviously I'm gathering not seen it. No, no, because it's a it's a student film. I mean, that's uh, it was right. never meant to go public per se. Although we did have sure. a quote unquote premiere at the school auditorium <laughs> for people to see. So you know, <laughs> people did see it. Um, that's no, cool. it was just uh, it was my senior project. It took uh, you know, it was a it was something that you had to do over the whole year, and it had to take time, effort, and uh, money, I guess, to uh, create sure. something that was. That was really the goal for all the senior projects. So I decided to do a, uh, you know, a, a film, and I love Star Trek. I um, this is gonna date me, but I own uh, all episodes of <laughs> The Next Generation on VHS. So oh my god, I, I'm a fan of Star Trek. Um, you know, I, I love Star Trek. It definitely um, I like the uh, I like Gene Roddenberry's vision of a utopic future where everybody can get along. I mean, I think that's um, you know one one ideal about Star Trek, you know. And uh, I'm an optimist. Oh, oh no no, I'm sorry. Um, so it's like uh, for me that that I just like that that vision, you know. And I grew up international, sure. so uh, you know, I'm mean, being in Japan. I went to an international school, <clears throat> Canadian Academy mm-hmm. is an international school, so. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Now I'm coughing. <laughs> um, God, right. Now we're all sick but, on the radio. Wait, way to go. Yay. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <yeah>. <clears throat> but uh, it's, um, um, it's, uh, it, it had, um, I, I have friends from uh, many different nations and cultures. So, you know, I mean, it, it definitely influenced my life and my outlook. Sure. And Star Trek, Star Trek definitely fit that outlook. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Star Trek because of that vision. And uh, that's why I did that. Uh, you know, I call it a fan film. I guess it's a student film. You know, um, sure. You know, this is back in 1995, so this is a good 20, 22 years ago. Yeah. Oh my goodness gracious! Now I know that for <laughs> folks that are always listening in, that are contemplating, you know, going into things like film, going into doing, you know, production, etc. So if someone's listening in now. Talk, if you would please, talk a bit about the differences, meaning in your mindset, um, and and also in your creativity and some of your vision. 
when you did that student film, if somebody's listening to you right now and thinking to themselves, you know what, maybe I want to try this. Maybe I want to shoot a little something. Is there something that you've obviously learned between doing Star Trek and then moving on and doing some of your own films? What's most pertinent, do you think, right off the bat, when you're doing that first film that people need to remember that's going to get you out there, get you noticed? You just have to go for it. And if you really love film, and for me, um, <clears throat> I got into film because of film music, uh, specifically okay. composer John Williams. I just love John Williams' music. Um, his score for Jurassic Park really influenced me when I saw that in the theater. I was like 15. Um, of course, Superman, Star Wars, he's done quite a lot. But his music just, I, I get goosebumps. I can feel it. Um, that's why I'm, I, you know, I mean, that's why I make films. Um, but yeah, I just think sure. go for it. And you know what? Technology now is just, so much better than it was 20 years ago. So, you know, you could shoot with your right. iPhone. You didn't have that I know. 20 years ago. So, you know, That's crazy. digital age. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, you know, I, I made four feature films, right? I would not have been able mm-hmm. to do any of those without the digital age. I mean, the digital age is amazing. Uh, social media, you know, that's how we connected, right? Um, right. Uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, you know, using the iPhones, doing these uh, Facebook Live, live things, or, you know, I mean, Instagram, you could do that too. I mean, it's just uh, sure. transferring files, you know, like for occupants, we had visual effects. And I worked with a company in India and a guy in the Philippines. And the files are huge. I mean, these are visual effects files. You know, they're movie files, so they're sure. they're massive. They have to be uh, master resolution. So sometimes there's several gigs. You could not have transferred several gigs over the internet in 1995. It's just not possible. This is that time. No kidding, right? When, uh, was, it, was it Johnny Mnemonic? Do you remember that film? Johnny yep. Mnemonic. With I do. Where he was able to okay. store. 320 gigabytes of data in his brain. And we're like, whoa, that's so much. But now it's like nothing. Right? I mean, it's amazing to me. It's fascinating. (laughs) Just the fact that a person can do a film on a phone just still blows my mind. I mean, I know it's possible. I see it all the time. But every time I'm like, dude, seriously? Like, really? Seriously? It's amazing. Yeah, I'd say to anybody listening, if they want to do a film, just go for it. I mean, it's just so much easier now than it was, you know, when I was growing up. So right. Just do it. Oh, sure. And just most people assume. Yeah. Well, and listen listen to this guy here. Now, Russ is saying this to you folks. You know, obviously, you should go for it. And I agree wholeheartedly. I think a lot of it comes down to you should have a dream. You should have passion. You should believe in yourself. You should go after it, even if necessarily, like, for instance, you went to the University of Southern California. I know that you had major, you had a major in uh, international relations and East Asian languages and cultures, and you had your minor in cinema and television. Because sometimes people are a little apprehensive about the idea of delving into an unknown field without having background or, or education. Now, having said that, since you did some of the work, you know, university work as far as studies and things like that, would you still encourage somebody out there to do this minus education? Because I know tons of people who do it, but some swear by, you know what, you got to have eight degrees, et cetera. You follow me? So which side of the fence do you stand on on that? You you don't need to uh, go to film school. I meant um, you can – you can learn. I mean, on the internet, there's. I'm sure there's like a class. You know, what do you call it? Uh, 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 you know, do it yourself kind of tutorials. Right. Um, yeah. No, I mean seriously. Um, if you're like in high school or I don't know, maybe middle school, and you're listening, and you just just shoot something, and then you know it's probably not going to be perfect. I mean, my first films weren't perfect at all. I mean, they were. Okay. I mean, no film is perfect, but you know, you just learn from your right. mistakes. Um, All right. And, you know, I mean, look, even the film I just did is not perfect. So, you know, I mean, I, um, I, I, I'm still learning and you will always learn. And I, get, I think I mentioned that Star Trek film I did, you know, in retrospect, it looks really bad. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, you just have to just, just go for it and just keep honing your skills, you know, with every film that I you agree. do. No, yeah. definitely, without a doubt, I would agree with that, definitely, because we always, on my show especially, I like to encourage people, just because you didn't finish this, didn't do this, just because you're this age, this, you know, ethnicity, et cetera, it shouldn't matter, it doesn't matter, that's the bottom line as far as that goes. Um, now, question for you, yeah. I know that 
you're a man of many means, meaning that you don't just direct or you don't just do this or this. So I want to talk about Dr. Film Fix. That's what you call yourself, right? Or is that the name of the call? I was going to say I came across this Dr. Film Fix because yeah. I know you do professional editing. Yeah, I, I do that too. I mean, lately because of occupants, I've been more okay. of being directing it. Um, ah. It's been, yeah, I mean, it's occupants as, I guess, um, uh, it, it's got got to me uh, directing gigs with a film called The Assassin's Apprentice by Paul Hickman and mm-hmm. uh, Collar by Tro- Troy Gavaldon. And then I'm working right now with um, uh, Sean Kenny, Sean and Taki Kenny. Okay. Sean Kenny was Captain Pike in the, uh, 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 was it the Menagerie episode of Star Trek, the original Star Trek. Oh, yeah. So, uh, but it's, yeah, lately it's been, um, and that project's called Alien Cross, and we're actually going to be shooting this Kickstarter video on the 23rd with uh, three other Star Trek cool. actors. So, um, okay. but yeah, I, I do, of course, yes, I do other um, other things on the side, um, like as you mentioned. Um, so, yeah, if anybody wants some <laughs> services, I'm here. Well, that's the reason yeah, I brought it up because yeah. I was going to say, hey, Ross, talk to us a bit about – tell us more in particular about like people that listen in because obviously mo- uh, a good number of them I know at least own businesses or in the same field or, or need editing services. So tell us a little more yeah. specifically – do you have specialties that you do in terms of the editing side of things? Are you multi-talented? Do you do multiple projects? Just give us all your offerings in terms of the editing side of things so people understand. Well, I mean, I uh, um, edited uh, behind-the-scenes videos. Uh, I created trailers. Um, you know, um, just it's, it's really just a nuance. Um, and, you know, it's just something where, um, you know, I, I, I guess you just feel it whether it feels right or not. And, um, you know, I seem to be able to do it, so. Nice. Um, Have you done sizzle reels yeah, it's before? Hard, or, um... it's, pacing. it's about pacing, you know, and, and when it okay. feels right, that, that, you know, it's basically just a feeling. Um, I, it's, it's, not, it's not subject, so um, it's just how, you know, I think it feels like uh, it feels right. This is the best way I can explain it. Makes sense. And then um, would you say you have a – what percentage of time you're spending on the editing? Meaning, again, for instance, somebody's listening in, they want to approach you. How accessible are you time-wise to be able to take on new projects in that realm? Uh, right now, it's a little more difficult, I have to admit. Okay. Because of sure. the different directing gigs I've been getting. Um, you know, I'm a director first and foremost, and uh, – you know, basically, uh, again, because of occupants, it's, it's definitely um, been a different dynamic since around maybe um, September or October of last year. Sure. It's changed. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, but I'm, I'm still here. I mean, I'm, I'm quite accessible on my website, which is R-U-S-S-E-M, M as in Mary, dot com, Russin dot com. So, you know. You uh, bet. Yeah, I'm. Well, but we want to throw that out there, obviously, because I know you've done that before. Are you still active in terms of web design? Because I know, too, that that was really cool because I'm like, he does web design, which is awesome. Probably because I need someone to help me with my own website. <laughs> so I was just thinking, hey, I need a guy like him. But do you, again, is it the same scenario? Are you finding you have less time to do things like that? Because I don't know how time-consuming web design really is, to be honest. Uh, it depends on the complexity of the design. Um, I've done one site that took three weeks. I've done another site, just just a page. It takes maybe two days. So it really depends on the complexity of the site. Um, yeah, I, okay. I still do it. It's just, you know, again, it's all about uh, time factor. Um, about oh, what's the client. I mean, note I, to self, Cindy, don't ask Russ for about yeah. six months to help you with your website. <laughs> Because <laughs> I was thinking about that, and I'm like, oh, my God, he probably has no time for that, which I don't blame you, man. Toting a film is not an easy thing to do. I- I'm well aware. I see this all the time with my friends. Well, I'll just I'll put it this way. Um, this morning, the editor for Collar, Emil Harris, who happens to be my editor of choice for pretty much all my films, so shout out to sure. Mr. Harris. But um, Okay. He just sent the second cut of Collar this morning and I have yet to watch it. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you know, that's, he is busy notes. folks. So okay. yeah, I mean that, I that's understand. my schedule. 
you know, um, and also, uh, you know, uh, some of my other time, um, like next month I have to travel to Idaho and then, um, uh, uh Denver, Denver, Colorado, and then, um, oh my gosh. And then for occupants and, you know, right. um, basically they invited occupants, um, at these various, um, um, conventions or film festivals. So, sure, of um, course. you know, sometimes my schedule, because of occupants, it's, again, you know, a lot more traveling has been happening. And, sure. um, you know, you know, a lot of these uh, conventions or festivals are kind and gracious enough to give me lodging or airfare um, or nice. stipend. It's the reason why I'm able to, um, you know, uh, travel because it's it's very um it's very tiring it's very grueling it's very tough on my skin because I have uh, <laughs> eczema. <laughs> so oh the, uh, no, oh, that's it, not pretty. Yeah. Uh, but you know it's um uh you know you go in an airplane you know you, it's a, bit, a lot of air conditioning so it dries your skin and uh, you know it's just sure. a different climates you know right now the East Coast is I think uh, being walloped by snow. Oh, oh yes, I, yes. Just yeah. yesterday we and, got like six inches here or eight inches or something like that. Yep. Oh, did you? Oh boy. Oh, oh boy. God, yeah, it's pretty yeah. out there. I mean, it's pretty, I, but it's I, I will, ugly. Yeah. I will not describe what it's like here in Huntington Beach, California. <laughs> I hate you. In a nice way, <laughs> that sucks, doesn't it, folks? You're like, yeah, I'm in sunshine. Sucks to be you. Thanks a lot, Russ. No, I understand. I'm not jealous because eventually I'll be visiting Vegas soon. So I'm like, ah, too bad you folks. But no, I just wanted to give the folks an introspect in terms of, you know, are you capable of offering other services? You know, because it's nice to be able to do that, to go out there and say, hey, you know, I can help people out with this or this. And it's a nice side gig, obviously, because we all know independent film pays $300,000 a year, right? (laughs) Oh, yeah. I'm waiting. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're talking to a millionaire, folks. I know exactly how this works. But, no, it's nice to be able to have those side projects and side jobs, obviously, because sometimes we all need that stuff in terms of keeping afloat if we're going to, you know, work on pursuing our dream while doing other stuff. So I totally get that. Um, yeah. I have to say that I was completely jealous because you have worked with, and we're going to talk about this now, folks, he has worked with, let's see, one, two, at least three people that I know of that I like very much. So we're going to talk about the different films and the different people. First of all, I would like to talk about, I love this, the synopsis of this movie. This is a film about a man with multiple personalities. I feel like I'm a multiple personality person every day. And I'm like, you worked with John Hurd. Oh, my God, folks. You all know who John Hurd is, right? Amazing. The name of the film being PJ, yeah. of course. So we want to talk about PJ. Talk about this movie because it sounds so intriguing. I want to know more. PJ. Okay, PJ uh, was uh, my first feature film um, that I ever did. Um, this was back in 2006 when we filmed it. Um, okay. What can I say? Well, first off, it, it was uh, the inception of the producer, Howard Nash. And a big shout-out to Howard because Howard and it, Howard's the reason why I'm making feature films. So, um, you know, every feature film I did is with Howard. And so basically okay. what happened was I, I had done a, a short film called Girl with Gun, and that was in 2004. And it basically got into a lot of festivals, won awards. It got into the San Diego Comic-Con, which was probably the highlight for that film. And because okay. of that film, um, it uh, garnered the attention of Howard. And Howard offered me um, uh, the directing gift for PJ. And PJ okay. already had a John Hurd, you know, who was uh, for people out there, the Home Alone dad. He was in Big. He was in Battlestar Galactica. I love him. Uh, he was Way, with Bette Midler in that one yeah. movie. Peaches. He was in Peaches. That's it. He was in, That's right. You're right. Yeah, that's right. Um, mm-hmm. He also had worked with uh, Howard um, in a film called Tracks. They did in 2005, I think, or 2004. And that had uh, also Ice-T. Um, okay. And so... So they, they, they worked on a film together before PJ. So, yeah, he, PJ had John attached. Uh, because of John, then it brought in uh, Robert Picardo, who, you know, from Star Trek Voyager. Robert Picardo, uh, basically, he and I have worked on six films together. So uh, since then, basically. Um, but, yeah, working with John, um, what can I say? John, John, is, John is amazing. I mean, he's definitely um, – he, he's a character – uh, in a good way, and 
when okay. he approaches a character, and, and it's just like um, he becomes that character. And it's amazing to see that transformation when you say action. He becomes sure. Dr. Alan Shears, which is the character he played. Um, and, yeah, we shot in New York. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from Huntington Beach, so, you know, I was, um, you know, basically uh, living – I was, like, quote-unquote homeless for two weeks, if you will. Uh, because that's when we shot December to January 20, um, um, 2006, 2007. So the only days I had okay. off were Christmas and New Year's. And I wasn't homeless. I was living at uh, my brother's then girlfriend's place. Now they're husband and wife and two beautiful children. But back then, nice. that's where I was staying. And yeah, those are the two days I had off were Christmas and New Year's. And I remember I was it on New Year's? What was it? Uh, like five minutes after the, the you know, was it the um, the ball dropped? I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was really tired. But it was an amazing experience. We filmed on um, uh, in Brooklyn and uh, at the Williamsburg Bridge around there, and it had this beautiful view of uh, Manhattan, of the uh, you know the island. Um, okay. And we had this one shot in the film where uh, John Hurd and uh, Glennis O'Connor, um, who played his wife in the film, they were basically looking over, looking out over Manhattan during Magic Hour. Magic Hour is when the sun is setting. And it creates this beautiful mm-hmm. orange hue. So it was like, um, it was magical, you know. Um, it was a very um, wonderful experience. And I loved working with John. So that's what I got. I'm so jealous. Music. So jealous right now. I can't even stand it. I'm like, you've been in the presence of greatness more than once. Yeah, I'm still liking you a lot. Oh, Now my question is, in terms of um, PJ, so if people – Listening to this, um, do they have access to it? Could they get access to it? Meaning, is it on Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, any place that we could find it online to watch it? Because I myself am intrigued to watch it. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Yeah, you uh, can go on Amazon um, Prime, and if you have Amazon Prime, you can okay. watch it right now. I um, do. I, I guess you, you can rent it, too. Um, you know, if you don't have Amazon Prime, you could rent it. Um, and, yeah, if you go on Amazon.com or maybe even eBay or something. I'm sure there's um, actual DVDs. Physical okay. Of the film. So, yeah, there are, it's out there. Nice. Yeah, I it. love it. I'm so excited. I'm so renting this. I'm definitely so renting this because I'm curious about it. It just sounds very intriguing. I'm not going to lie. And it's not just because it's you, but seriously, it sounds great. Now, on to guy number two. To those that listened in to me for the last how many years, you already know, I used to have an entire radio show where I interviewed the cast of Sons of Anarchy. Uh, Ryan Hurst, I did not interview Partly because he scares me. I'm I'm not lying about this. Have you ever, to those listening in, have you looked at him? He's scary. Not lying. Mm -hmm. The man looks scary. And I'm like, oh, my God. So here comes Ross. Did a production called Behind the Green. So, of course, we want to talk about Behind the Green. And, of course, the experience with someone like that. Because, obviously, um, Ryan Hurst, I remember him back in the day in that football movie. Remember that football movie from, like, ages ago? Uh, you know, yeah. obviously, leaving forward to some of the anarchy, right. et cetera. So how did you get connected with him? And then tell us a little bit about how this film in particular, I always like to ask filmmakers, did you, you as the filmmaker, do you have a partiality to like a PJ behind the green? Is it something you haven't done yet? Have you found your magic film? That's what I call it, where the filmmaker says, I love this film. Well, yeah, that, that's, um, uh, first off, behind the green is actually the behind the scenes uh, documentary of the film Chasing the Green, which is the feature film that was mm. Ryan Hurst was in that I directed. But um, yeah, Behind the Green, by the way, I edited that. <laughs> so there you go. Okay. Well, uh, there you go. Yeah, I, uh, I I did the uh, the BTS uh, videos for um, for Chasing the Green also. But um, nice. No, Chasing the Green is the is the feature film with Ryan Hurst. It also has Jeremy London okay. of uh, Party Five and uh, William Devane. Who was? Um, oh yeah. Um, yeah, it was who was secretary and President Heller in twenty four, and uh, I love for me, William was, Devane. Uh, oh, Bill Devane is amazing, and you know he was directed by Alfred Hitchcock in Family Plot. <gasps> so, oh my like, God. Like, yeah, it's like I look up to Hitchcock, so I it was like that. That was surreal, but. Getting back to Ryan, yeah, Ryan. By the way, he did not have that beard that he had in Sons of Anarchy and Chase the Green. So <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't as imposing, but yeah, he is. You know, he, he's a very imposing Isn't he? uh, man, and he he played the more, I guess, the darker brother. You know, in the film, 
Um, sure. And no, so he also was directed by Steven Spielberg. Um, and, you know, oh, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, I, I think it was Saving Private Ryan. He was in there, and I think he was directed directed oh, by uh, yeah. Kevin Ostner in The Postman. So you know, he's been directed by some great, um, amazing sure. filmmakers. You know, as much as Bill Devane was directed by Alfred Hitchcock. You know, um, sure. so you know, I, I'm um, you know, I, I only only aspire to be. Um, you know, at the level of Spielberg or, um, you know, Costner or Hitchcock. I really do. I mean, I, I think they're amazing. So, you know, I, I know, you know, it was kind of intimidating, if you will, because they worked with these people. I'm sure. Right? I sure. right. I'm just nobody. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. Directing him, it was, uh, it was great. It was great. He had great ideas. Uh, and, um, you know, um, of course, we, uh, the way I direct actors is, um, I would, um, you know, have rehearsals in pre-production. Pre-production is right before you start filming. Um, on okay. set, I give actors an entrance and an exit for every scene, um, just like in a play, um, mm-hmm. because I think that that's more natural. I tell them, look, if um, certain words you cannot say or it just doesn't feel natural because you're not used to saying it, then change it as long as the story is still there. You know, change it so that, you can say it in a more natural way, if you will. Uh, so that that's like the advice I give to pretty much, you know, I've, all my actors, if you will. And, you know, and that's how we worked. We filmed for what, 21 days, I think 20, 21 days. We were in New York again. We filmed in uh, Westchester County, which is the County above um, the five boroughs. Okay. And we were in like white plains and, um, Croton on the Hudson, which is a great place. Um, we filmed at a courthouse for Croton on the Hudson. I remember that. It's a beautiful um, courtroom scene that we had. But yeah, it was a great experience. Um, oh, know, I imagine. Um, yeah, I, I, I love New York. And uh, there's a very strong possibility, by the way, that I will be going back to film uh, <gasps> a feature called um, uh, it's called The Whisper Project. But um, and that's again with Howard, the producer. So it's a very that's strong awesome. possibility. I'm packing my bags for the summer. That's awesome. I absolutely love it. I was going to mention that. That I know, obviously, that you have an affinity for New York, as do I. Obviously, there's just something so well. As there's something so magical about New York City and shooting film there, and it's just such an experience. So kudos to you on that. I bet you enjoy that. Well, cross your fingers. We'll see. Um, I always like to talk about. Um, non-professional things on my show, meaning that the people that are listening in should realize that Russ actually, besides standing and directing a film, is actually a person too. He doesn't just produce and direct and edit. He's actually a live, real person with live, real likes. So there's some of the things that I know about him. For First of all, congratulations, because I know you're a fan of the Chicago Cubs. A lot of my friends are Cubs fans, so of course you had an awesome season this year, which I thought was cool. So I saw that. I want you to explain to me, because it appears that you're a fan of Jared Leto. So explain this to me. I have a child who's 10, um, and I, I think he has a Joker obsession, and I mean the Jared Leto Joker. So I was going to ask you have, if you had seen Suicide Squad, because this child is like obsessed with this Joker, and I don't understand. I mean, maybe I'm not. I mean, I'm not a big director, but I'm like, oh my god, he's scary and ridiculous. So tell me, as a director, have you seen the movie? And if you saw it, please tell me that you don't think it's like a well-made movie because I don't understand the hype. Well, first off, it's an Oscar winning movie, right? <laughs> well, technically, it won like some kind of thing. <laughs> For makeup. Yeah, personally, I thought it yeah. uh, Lord should have got Star Trek, but that's just me. Yeah, but no, I, I, I actually saw Suicide Squad on the airplane to uh, one oh, of you? my occupants. Yeah. Okay. And um, it wasn't a bad film. I mean, it, it wasn't like a fantastic film, but it was, it was, it was, um, it wasn't. It wasn't bad. Okay. It was okay. Do you like his? Do you like his Joker? Because I know that some people stand on different sides of the fence. Because I remember Dallas Buyers Club, so I'm still stuck with Jared Leto in that. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so it's hard. I like, I like Jared. It, in that film was really, really. He was good. I mean, there's a re- reason why he won the Oscar. But yeah, you know, right. for me, um, Joker. Honestly, I grew up with um, with um, with a Jack Nicholson's Joker. That's my Joker. Right. So right, hard exactly. for me. 
to, you know, uh, it's a very different Joker that Jared did. And I'm not saying it's bad, but it's, it's um, I, I think, um, how would I put it? Like uh, Jack Nicholson's Joker was more comical. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Heath Ledger's Joker was definitely serious. And I think Jared's Joker was maniacal. Maybe it would be the best way to put it. I mean, it just <laughs> was crazy. Um, right. It's a different interpretation of the Joker, you know. Um, right. But again, because of my childhood, I, I will always go to uh, Jack Nicholson's Joker. Amen to that one. I'm still using that line with my kid today. He just gets so defensive. He's like, oh, my God, he's like the best Joker in the world. I've seen this movie. He makes me watch it. Like, literally, I've seen it eight times. I'm so out of Suicide Squad, I can't even stand it anymore. I'm like, oh, my God, okay, fine. So some more things that I know that you like. This is awesome. He's a Sinatra and a Dean Martin fan. Anybody, anybody who says that they like Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra is welcome on my show every day because those are like my two top favorites. I I actually interviewed Deanna Martin, Dean Martin's daughter. Oh, my God, was she lovely. Just I imagine just as lovely okay. as her father would have been, which is awesome. I mean, she is a top-notch class act just like her father. Oh, my God, it was amazing. Um, I love that you love Maleficent because she's like the most badass woman on film I've ever seen. So I'm like, that was amazing. And I just watched The Sixth Sense the other day. But here's what I want to ask you because I know that you are a Game of Thrones fan. I keep yeah. asking people this because I'm not. What is the what is it? Okay, it's like The Walking Dead too. I'm like, why do you people watch this? <laughs> so help me understand why people sit in front of a TV and watch Game of Thrones. I don't get it. Okay, what what is well, it? Well, first off, I read all the novels, and so, you know, ah. I, I kind of, uh, I'm a fan of the books, so I was curious okay. to see what they would do, um, and um, I think it me- it's been meandering a little, you know, in the l- latter seasons, but that's because really? George R. R. Martin, <laughs> <laughs> so the showrunners have to go on their own. That's my opinion. But it's a, look, it, it has an amazing title sequence. I love the music and I just love how they uh, present it. I love the characters. Um, I, I just love following them. You know, I, I think they're, they're um, you know, whether it's uh, Daenerys Targaryen or uh, Jon Snow, uh, it's just an amazing, amazing, uh, I guess, milieu of, uh, of characters. And by the way, if you really, really love the Game of Thrones, Listen to uh, Patrick Spinagle. Um If you go on Facebook, look up Pat Spinagle, and he he does his podcast on Game of Thrones. So he's a bigger ah. Game of Thrones fan than I. And I, I only mention him because uh, he and his wife Lisa, they were mm. kind and gracious enough to uh, house me when I was over there for the DC Independent Film Festival about a week, uh, oh, month nice. ago. Oh, nice! Wonderful Very people. Nice. So. Yeah, I met them uh, last year. Was it last year? No, two years ago now, at a, a Farpoint uh, Farpoint convention. Uh, the first time, and uh, oh, they nice. saw Occupant. And since then, we've been friends. And um, you know, I also met uh, some other wonderful people there, like Mark E and Lakita Edwards. But yeah, I met Pat. Okay. He's a big Game of Thrones fan. So seriously, anybody out there oh, listening to his podcast, you love Game of Thrones? Listen to that. I'm looking forward oh my to the season. It's kind of sad that it's ending, but, you know, I mean, all good things must I come heard. to end, right? Well, right, of course. And you know what? We all know that I think if anything gets overdone, like I was just saying this to somebody. I don't know if you're a fan, but obviously they did Kong again. So now it's Kong Skull Island. And I was just saying to people, <laughs> that's my question to you. As a filmmaker, really, let's say, for instance, you have, like, The Assassin's Apprentice, and let's say it takes off right, and then you say, okay, yeah. every year I'm going to keep making it and keep making it. Why can't a classic stay a classic? Do you know what I'm saying? And I know I, you know, I have my own films. I'm just a tiny person. I don't really direct. But do you know what I mean? At what point does cinema turn away from being a classic and become more cliche by doing it again and again and again? You know what I mean? Yeah, there there is that argument, and I was afraid, by the way, um, with Rogue One for Star Wars, that, that would happen. But Rogue One was a really well done film, so I'm looking forward to Episode okay. Eight. Um, but there is a okay. point, like the X Files. I'm a big fan of the X Files, but the latter mm-hmm. seasons of the original run, they were a little. Com- it was uh, convoluted, I guess would be the way to put it. It just you know didn't feel like X Files anymore. So you know, and uh, what, what's the thing? Jump the shark. Or nuke the fridge, <laughs> you know. At some point, um, yeah, jump the shark. I think was a phrase on the Fonz and Happy Days. He jumped the shark, and at that point, right. it veered into the ridiculous. And I, I think at some point, you know, all good things just must come to an end. Like I was right. very happy to start 
next generation ended after seven seasons it just felt right you know i mean if it had kept going on i think it would have been a little it, it would have stretched it would have been too much of a stretch so um with the new kong i have not seen it although i've heard you know people like it so i, I may see it i don't know um, that's what i'm hearing too i just thought well yeah it's but, over and over and over and over again i'm like what happened with the last one i like the last one i'm like why do we got to do it again the last one was good you know what i'm saying <laughs> The last one was, I think, Peter Jack in college? Yeah. I, is there one? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that was legit. I think, oh, crap. See, now you're making me think about, damn it, we're not talking about this anymore. It just frustrates me because I'm like, seriously, the last one had great special effects. Adrian Brody was in it. Jack Black was in it. It was yeah. well done. I don't know if I like the chick that played the, the one necessarily, but it was just a good film. That's why I'm like, you know what? Can't you just leave it at a good film? You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying I about that Ni- one. Watts? Naomi Watts, I think, was... Yeah, that's the it, Naomi Watts. For some reason, I just I was struggling with her being the lead. Don't don't ask me why. It just it wasn't a fit for me. But I'm like the rest of them. I think the effects were great. I think the story went well. I think it was good. It's just that simple. So I guess we'll just but, see how. But, uh, is. I, I, I gotta play devil's advocate here. I mentioned how sure. X Files got a little convoluted in the latter seasons. Well, guess what? I enjoyed the the uh, the new the new season, season ten that just came out last year, and I look mm-hmm. forward to season eleven. Uh-huh. So there is a way that a show can, I guess, reinvent itself, and X Files was able to do that. So I'm very happy about that. I hear you. And you know, Twin Peaks is coming back for season three. I'm looking I forward heard. to that. Yeah, I, I heard. Just, That's you know, gonna be so, awesome. You know, I'm actually. There, it's a. Uh, it's very subjective. You know, I mean, at some point, yeah, you can jump the shark, but at the same time, you can reinvent also. So you know, I mean, I'm. I, I oscillate, I guess, between you know pro, the pros and cons of. <laughs> if that's a good way to put it. No, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. That is exactly right. Um, The other two things that I know about you is, to the best of my knowledge, you're not married. And I ask this because there's always people creeping on my page. It means they're looking at me, and then they're looking at you. So at least one person (laughs) I know said, hey, he's not bad looking. So we just want to confirm in case big director guy here isn't single that I'm not putting my foot in my mouth. Well, right now I'm single, but, you know, honestly, making films is just very time consuming. <laughs> right. I know exactly what you're talking about. Very much else besides filmmaking. So for me, all my films are like my children. That's how I kind of look ah. at it right now. Um, gotcha. You know, my, my brother, um, Chris, has a beautiful family. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of energy and a lot of effort and a lot of love. Oh, I bet. Into that. Oh, of course. I, I don't I know I can do that, you know, and it's not fair um, to to anybody else if I'm, you know, can't put my full energy into something. That's how I look right. at it anyway. So um, you know, that's a great now, attitude, my, actually. Yeah, my life has um, gotten even more, I guess, um, complicated with with the new um the new films and everything so uh, that's where i am right now so okay so ladies don't hit on him apparently because it's just going to be a no go no go no go no go but that's okay we have to throw that out there just in case but what i thought was really super neat and i don't come across as much as and i'm assuming you still have time for this but you're a coin collector yes i thought that was really neat yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh she's a coin collector but do you get to do yeah, that I, I, I mean because you're so busy yeah i it's uh it's it's um a, a hobby that my grandmother started my late grandmother on my paternal side Aww. um she collected yeah she um she collected one cent coins and I okay. pretty much can it because I think it's very fascinating the reason I and when I say one cent they're American one cent and the reason I collect American one cent coins is because unlike the other denominations it only had one year where it wasn't minted. The other coins, they had several years. So for me, it's like Uh, very, it's continuous since uh, 1793, which is when, um, and the penny and the half cent, there was a half cent and a cent. Um, These are large cents. You know, back then they had, um, it was different. But um, it's just very fascinating. Um, The one cent coin, it was one of the first coins ever minted by the U.S. Mint, and maybe George Washington held it, maybe one of the founding fathers held some of the coins that I have. Wow. I mean, I, I, it's a lot of history there. And, you know, I meant back then, it's, um, they had, um, what was it, uh, uh, the, the goddess Liberty was on the coin. Liberty, like li- Libertas, it was from the French. Mm-hmm. And so it was, Lady Liberty was on all the coins, unlike today. It's, you know, it's changed. And, oh, yeah. um, you know, so different. Um, just that, 
Yeah, it just said on the back, one cent and United States of America. That's it. <laughs> that was the coin. Wow. Um, you know, that, that's literally what the coin was. It says, um, you know, I mean, it was so different. I, I think uh, George Washington probably would be rolling in his grave knowing that his uh, portrait <laughs> on, on the quarter, because he specifically told um, – um, the coin, the the coin makers back then, do put my face on my on the coin because it's too much like the monarchy of Britain. So, oh my gosh! Uh, now that's the history of coins. So I collect it because there's I love history, right? And uh, you're you're able to see that history in in the coinage, and I think it's fascinating. And by the way, I think the the one cent coins are beautiful, and it's changed over the years. So it started with large cents, then in 1857, it. Um, no, yeah, in 1857, with by an act of Congress, they made those the pennies that we have today. But back then, it was like the flying eagle. They became the Indian head. Then it became the Lincoln coin that we have today. So, you know, you just see all that history. It's amazing. I mean, like in 1943, there was a steel cent. Do you know why it was steel in 1943? Because uh, the U.S. needed the copper for the war effort. You see, history. Oh my it's gosh, That's there in those That's cents. fascinating. You, you get you get to just see it even to the present day, and it's still being minted. And I I hope it's still going to be minted, even though like Canada they get they got rid of their penny. So I hope we don't get rid of ours. I didn't know that. Like, oh my god! Them. Don't even go there. Don't say things like "Oh my god!" I can't even imagine that. Could you imagine? I don't want to even think about it. That's and that's a I, neat I hobby to have, especially it's past time. <laughs> my god! Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's nice to. And it's nice to see that hobby is still going around because, to be honest with you, I've only met a couple in my lifetime that have done something like that. But I think it's extraordinary to to invest your time and your efforts into something like that. That's a neat hobby to have, definitely. Now, um, I just want to sing your praises for a moment here. Folks that are listening in, just so you know, his productions have uh, received awards at the following places. Now, just listen to this. Hollywood TV Festival, the Miami Underground Film Festival, the New Jersey International Film Festival, Canada International Film Festival, World Fear Houston, South California Film Festival, the 2015 Action On Film Festival. Do you know what that means? You know what the hell you're doing. That's impressive. You know why? Because some people don't know what the hell they're doing in this industry. I didn't just say that out loud. Yes, I did. It's a medication. But that right there is a sign. First of all, people are noticing your work. And they're noticing it not just because it's a good production, of, but also all the components. I think people tend to forget a film is not made just for the director standing there. It's a combination of directors, actors, DPs, um, camera people, um, wardrobes, props, the whole nine yards. So the art of film is not just that. So kudos to you on being recognized in all those different places. Um, now, I want to get to talking about um, occupants first. But first, before you talk about the film itself, I want to know how the premiere went um, at Pasadena International Film Festival because you were just there, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's um, it's still going on, this festival. So anybody who um, oh. wants to see one of the films, it's still going on, the festival. And okay. um, it's going to go on Thursday. Um, okay. And I... I, I I plan to go um, either today or tomorrow just to see. Um, I, I like to see other filmmakers' films. Um, as sure. for my premiere, I guess yeah, it was a premiere. Um, it was last Thursday at, I think, 8.30 p.m. It went well. I mean, okay. people liked it. Um, we were um, grouped with a, a, another film, um, which is also a wonderful film. Um, and um, – I, it, it, was a, it was a good crowd. I mean, it was a uh, near full house and, um, you know, people had um, excellent questions and yeah, it was great. Um, I, I, I like it when, you know, people enjoy the film, you know, and are entertained mm-hmm. because it's entertainment. Right. And so you know, it makes <laughs> yeah. them happy when they laugh at the right moments or they gasp at the, you know, the right moments. And when I say gasp, because this veers in the horror, um, you mentioned which film I like best. Um, probably yeah. Occu Good. It feels right. And, really? Yeah, and it's uh, kudos to the screenwriter Julia Camera. She's the one who created, you know, the the script. She wrote the script. It's her script. And Howard <laughs> Nash, you know, optioned her script. And since I've been working with Howard on uh, was it PJ Chasing the Green, uh, The Legend of Messiah, right. which is also one film with Robert Picardo. It's like a Princess Bride type story. Um, but yeah, you know, with Occupants, you know, um, we got uh, wonderful actors. Robert Picardo came back 
Um, but also Brianna White played Annie in the Parallel Annie. Yeah. And uh, Michael Pugliazzi played Neil in Parallel Neil. And they won awards for their performance. And uh, so so uh, they're up for a nomination uh, at the Utah Film Awards coming up. And so is Bob Picardo, which I'm very happy about. But, yeah, you know, it's won a lot of awards. Um, and it's a, just, you know, kudos to Julia. She's won an award. Kudos to the actors. You know, um, sure. just kudos to the editor and the DP. And, you know, editor won an award. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, it's a really good team and um, really good. Um, it just It just worked. It worked very well. So, um, you know, I was just very happy that, um, you know, people are enjoying the film at like the Pasadena International Film Festival. Um, right. You know, it just makes me, it makes me very grateful that people like this film. So. Well, and I was going to mention That's that, but I noticed said. that you have, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to mention that you have an ongoing rela- working relationship with Robert as well. And I was wondering about the chemistry between you and he and how you formed this working relationship. I haven't met him, but he, he looks like an incredible actor. And I thought to myself, well, I know other directors that have a kinship with some of the actors that they use and then they continue to use them again and again and again. So I'm just curious about Robert's talent in terms of what makes you want to pick him and use him and put him in films that you produce. Well, he's a great actor. I mean, this guy has been, um, he's worked with some great um, directors like Joe Dante. Um, okay. You know, he's pretty much all of his films, you know, Inner Space, uh, The Birds. Mm-hmm. Um, he's worked with Paul Verhoeven, Total Recall. You know, he was a, a cast regular on Star Trek Voyager for seven seasons from 1995 to 2001. And he's worked on shows like uh, Wonder Years. Um, right. You know, he, he wanted got a nomination, an Emmy nomination for his uh, per- performance as a gym coach. Um, you know, he's a great <laughs> actor, and it's just such a pleasure to work with him. And, you know, I was just so happy that he got a nomination for, um, you know, for Occupants, because it's such right. a great performance. And he just brings his, um, I guess, his, um, you know, his, his uh, resume to, um, to, to any production, and he actually cares for the role and he works with the other actors and he likes to rehearse with them and you know he likes to make sure that you know the script um basically his dialogue makes uh, you know 100 percent sense and of course you know uh he would uh offer suggestions because you know i mean this mm-hmm. is a guy who's been you know acting for a good several decades so he has a lot of um uh what do you call it uh, a lot of talent uh, a lot of um a lot of notes or <laughs> I, I I don't know what the right word, word would be, but, you know, he's basically, um, he's been there, done that. So, you know, he has really good suggestions and, um, and then, yes, yeah, we talk about it like for occupants. That's what I did. You know, he was there. So were mm-hmm. the other two actors, even though they weren't physically acting with him because, you know, they mm-hmm. were talking to him in the film uh, via a web chat. However, I wanted them there because I wanted that performance to be natural, and it would not have been if he wasn't if they were not there to interact with him. So, literally, when we filmed his scene, we filmed in the bedroom of that of the house that we got, and it was in front of a green screen. And then the room was so small they were in the closet. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> and the, and the camera was you know also there uh, because yeah, there just wasn't a lot of space. So they were like saying the lines in the closet, and you know Bob was interacting oh. with them. And oh my God! I really? That it worked. I mean, it worked. It worked really well, and a lot of people have said that. Um, but honestly, if they were not there, I don't know if the performances would have been the same. So. Oh, I know. imagine. Well, and I've looked at Robert before too, and I'm like, I don't know, maybe it's just you, Ross, but he's scary looking too sometimes. I'm like, you must really like these scary looking guys, because I'm like, they're all very intense and serious, and I'm like. Apparently, you gravitate to that, which is fine, but I was like, oh, my God, I could not be on a set with these people. It would would be kind of maddening and a little scary and all that good stuff, but, you know, it works. The best directors pick the best people to work with, not only for the chemistry that they have, but obviously for the performance that they bring, certainly. So I'm curious to ask, when you mentioned, of course, your favorite being occupants, tell us why. Tell us why this is your so-called swan song, meaning that your preferred film of course and why do you believe that it's doing so well on the film circuit in your opinion well first off i hope it's not my swan song 
<laughs> I mean, this is my last film. I oh, yes. quote, uh, oh, my I, God. I, 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 I need to get off the sauce here. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> I got a quote. Akira Kurosawa, who made his last film, was called Maradayo. Oh, okay. No, I'm still here. That's Swan really song. Here. Way to go, Sydney. <laughs> Let's scratch that one. But, so tell us why this is your favorite film. See, that's applicable. Because I'm curious. I want to uh, know what it is about it's, it's, occupants. I, I just love the the concept of, of a you know multi, a multiverse, a parallel universe, but not just one, but you know infinite numbers basically. And the fact that um, there's a duplicate of yourself or multiple duplicates. But imagine your um, parallel self is a psychopath. Does that mean that you okay. are a psychopath? You see, and suddenly Ooh, it becomes nice. very uncomfortable. And that's what this film is about. It it makes you question yourself. And and I, I like that. I, I told you that I'm half Japanese, half white. So I know about right, dichotomy. Right. I know about duality. You know, I under, I've been in two different cultures. As we mentioned at the beginning of the interview, Japan versus right. the United States. It's very different cultures. So I understand that. So, you know, when uh, I approached the occupants, it totally made sense to me. You have real Annie and Neil and parallel. Annie and Neil, and but guess what? They're both they're both uh, they're both the genuine article. They just had different life experiences, and so it's like taking that duality and splitting it into two. And what happens is, um, you know, this is like a, it's a found footage film. So you know, um, right. my inspiration, well, I guess, was like Cloverfield because they did a lot of transmedia in that film with the the uh, mm. the viral marketing, which I, by the way, I, I, we did for occupants. So I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, but, you know, the Blair Witch Project, of course, started this found footage craze, if you will. But we wanted a, okay. a fresh spin on it. And a lot of people said that we were able to um, achieve that. And one thing I did not want to do, like in Cloverfield, is have jerky camera movement because it made my ah. friend Neely, when we saw that film, made her sick. It made a lot of people sick. So we were our, – our movements are more calm, if you will. And we were uh, purposely okay. – we purposely did that. And Cloverfield, it's, it's a great film. I'm just saying that it made people sick, you know. Not me, but some other people. <coughs> because of motion. Oh, right, happened. no. So, right. um, and, but one, one thing I loved about Cloverfield is just the way they did the viral marketing with the slush o' cola and Taraguto, the, that Japanese corporation <laughs> we bring back to Japan. But they, that, they did that, and they made these viral videos. Um, and you have to surf the web to find it. So, okay. <laughs> for us, we did the same thing. Uh, so it's a found footage film, then it veers to science fiction and becomes pure horror, which is why it won the uh, top prize, um, the best science uh, sci-fi feature film award at Street Fest, which was uh, which was something amazing, by the way. Um, you know, shout out to Denise Gossett, uh, the the uh, festival founder and director. Uh, Shreep nice. Fest because never thought we would win that prize. I mean, that is like that's like winning the lottery. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I'm veering. Um, so with uh, <laughs> occupants, okay. the reason I like it, and yeah, there's a lot of a lot of information. By the way, talk about occupants for hours, so mm, I can babble. I, I won't babble. But about <laughs> occupants, you know, yes. it, you, we have we have. Uh, it was the Peterson Research Institute who put together this footage, and Dr. Peterson is Robert Picardo, um, and uh, we have a Peterson Research Institute site. PRI-research.info. We also have a comic book tie-in to the film, drawn by a DC Marvel Comics artist, Dave Beatty. And it okay. um, takes place during Act 1 and 2 of the feature film. Then we have the feature film. Now we have a sequel being written by Julia, Julia Camera, you know, the writer of the first film. And she's 30 okay. pages into it yesterday. So... Um, why do you, is this my favorite film? It's because there's so much mm -hmm. potential. Uh, it's because okay. uh, the first film was well received, <clears throat> and it seems to be a lot of support. And people want to know. They they care for these characters. Um, they 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 um they want to know what happens after this. And you know, for me, um, you know, I, I think franchising is very um very um interesting. You know, we talked about going too far. Well, I I, I uh, honestly think that uh, if you can expand the storyline, uh, I think that's very fascinating. It's like building a puzzle. 
you know, so, or like coin collecting, you know, you just keep right. adding and adding and add, see, you know, where we can take occupants um, for occupants two, maybe occupants three, because with the multiverse, ah. you have literally an infinite number of possibilities that you can go. So I you bet. introduce the universe one in occupants. Well, guess what? You're going to do parallel universe two in occupants two. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's my wow. going because there's so much potential and people it has been um it's been received uh very well by people, if you will. You know, they they want to know what sure. what uh happens. and it's also the film that's keeping me busy, if you will. Um oh, I not imagine. that I don't I mean, I love my other films, but this film seems to have um I guess hit the jackpot, if you will. So I gotcha. I'm very, and that's exciting. Very so, and I, I don't. I don't well, and that, and one of one of the things I wanted to say, of course, too, is is once you get involved in the circuit, like you said, you're at Pasadena International Film Festival. Then on the 20th, you leap over from the 20th to the 26th. I know that it's premiering at the uh, Russian International Horror Film Festival and Awards. Yeah. Plus, you're going to be at the Toronto International Spring of Horror and Fantasy Film Festival in April, from the April 7th to the 9th. <laughs> so I know that there's a lot of jumping around and and going here to going here, and it's exciting. I mean, I'm very excited for you. That's just that whole experience of making the film and then seeing that audience and watching their reaction and knowing that it's being so well received. It's exciting, of course. I mean, who wouldn't, you know, be thrilled about something like that? So kudos. But we don't want to forget about the the Assassin's Apprentice because that's important. That's the whole reason you and I well, met actually was. was that film. Because of Assassin's And I want to do a major shout out to everybody who contributed to our Indiegogo campaign. Yeah. Because you got over 10 thousand dollars and our original goal was sixty two hundred. Wow. And don't think that this money won't go to waste. It will not. We need that money. Sure. So you don't know how grateful I am that you know, um and you 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 too, yours truly, Cindy. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> but yeah I haven't done ground. anything except put you on radio yet. The rest is to be determined. Well, you, but you, go you ahead, know, thank honestly, you. And, no, no, no. I, I'm telling you right now, um what you're doing for me Right now, it's like you're giving me publicity, and I appreciate it. You don't yeah. know how much I appreciate it. Thank you it, so. so much. That's so kind oh, no, of you. No, thank no, you. No, don't, don't say, no thank you. <laughs> oh, so, my God. Look at this. Thank you, Fast. <laughs> okay, about a we Assassin's can go Apprentice. Things all, day, all day long. I know, but right? Uh, but we should talk about that. But Assassin's Apprentice it, it not only has Robert Picardo, it also has Tara Page, is a renowned stunt actress, Tara Page. She was like in Alice in Wonderland in the Transformers. Oh, yeah. Of Extinction. And guess what? She's a really good actor. So I'm very happy really? that she's in the role of Kaylee. Yep, she's Kaylee in this film. And guess what? We're doing par okay. four in this, this freestyle run. <laughs> Okay. And, and she does a lot of running, and she does her own stunts, and she's amazing. She's tireless. She climbs walls. She literally uh, jumps fences, literally. I'm telling you, she's jumping fences in this film. She's, like, going over cars. Um, we just did pickup shots uh, uh, with her, like, a couple weeks ago. Um, and, you know, and Paul Hickman is the one who wrote this, and he, he started this um, this project. And shout out like, to Paul um, Hickman. Oh, well, big shout out to Paul Hickman. And big we also have Marina Sir. Marina Sirtis was Counselor Troy in Star Trek to the Next Generation. So, you know, I'm mean, ah. to work with her amazing for me um but yeah basically this uh film uh will uh, we wanted to herald a trilogy we have a trilogy a movie trilogy in mind and also a video game so there's a lot of possibilities with the assassin's apprentice and right now i'm working with paul um we're in like uh we're in post-production right now on the film so that's why we did that indigo nice. Plus campaign because we're gonna have this okay. uh fully done by this amazing company named Junior Proposed. They won an Emmy Okay. Uh, or a uh, James Cameron uh, production. It was a documentary. Um, it's like uh, 10 years before. And Foley is uh, like footsteps and, um, you know, like cloth effects and all that. And in a film like sure. Assassin's Apprentice, you have a lot of running, you have a lot of action. Well, you need that Foley. So, uh, you know, a substantial portion of that money that we raise is going to go for Foley. Uh, visual effects. We have visual effects work, um, and, um, you know, there's going to be, like, uh, a Google-style glass where you get to see, you know, images in it, and that's visual effects right there. 
there's other uh, shots like drones. We have drones in the film, real drones, prop drones. Oh, my God. Drones. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I mean, um, uh, that's where we are in the, in, in the project right now. I think um, okay. our editor, Emil Harris, I mentioned him many, many times because Emil mm-hmm. Harris and I have worked on every yes. single production. But Emil um, Harris is um, um, going to pro- provide a second cut of the film in a couple of days. So that's where we are cool. with him. That's yeah. awesome, and I'm excited. So I'm, I'm just Cassie excited. Yeah. See, he's got something look else coming out. That. And we don't want to forget to talk about this. I know of, obviously, the dollhouse you have not shot as of yet, right? You're going to be headed to Ohio for that one. So I gather that that's one that's in the hopper, one of four, actually, I have listed here. Uh, yeah, the dollhouse would be in Ohio. And... Mm-hmm. um Right now, uh, again, the script is being written by Emil Harris. He's a really, really good writer. <laughs> good um, deal. We're, gear, we're aiming for um, summer, um, and um, okay. and basically it's a horror feature um, about okay. a dollhouse. There's not much I can say about it because otherwise it'll give away the story. I was but just going to say I'm probably not going to press you too hard there, but that's creepy. Yeah. Just the idea of dolls. Is, dolls. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Exactly. And the the producer is Julie Del Locio, and she lives okay. in Macedonia. So right now uh, we're working on that, and the script is uh, okay. a, very close to being completed. But that's where we are with that Good project. Deal. Yeah. Okay. And, and then you know, our Girl with Gun, yeah. now is that that's still being worked on, or are we are looking for that soon too? Girl with Gun, the feature, that's – something that's like a passion project but that will involve the very very big budget so hopefully you know ah. um, that you see a lot of projects the way it works is a lot of them are in development if you will uh, right. until you're able to get financing and at that point then uh, you're able to make that project so right. I just did a film with Holler with uh, the uh, producer Troy Gabaldon and actor Sean Gunnel uh, Michael Ray um, and uh, Denise Gossett and Jennifer Durst. So those, those that, mm. that was our cast, and you know our DP is Ray Carwell, um, and it was, it was a great project. But guess what? The the money was there, so <laughs> that's why we were able to shoot it. And it's at, it's a very good uh, concept piece. I mean, it's um, it, I can't really say too much, but let's just say it involves a a vigilante priest. There you go. Oh, I will say. see, he's giving us teasers here. This is exciting. Oh, my God, we got teasers in the middle well, of the, the afternoon. This is awesome. Tagline, the tagline is, uh, not all sins can be forgiven. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and you can feel that dark music exactly. just coming. Yeah. So now yeah, so my biggest question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just mm. saying that's why with projects, you know, um, it, it's financing. Financing is, is a major factor. And one thing about occupants, it has helped to spearhead that. So um, I, I'm, I'm definitely on board um, for any production. Uh, once the financing okay. is in place, you know, give my 150% all. And I, I love making films and, um, you know, I'm just very grateful that people would think of me to be able to direct uh, whichever project it is. So, you know, I want to oh, direct all of them. Sure. Yeah. Of course, Rome wasn't built in a day, obviously, and you'll have to have time to do all sorts of other things. But you know, you've got a terrific thing going here. I mean, 20 is director, 29 is producer. You've got all this stuff in the hopper. I also noticed that you did not um, cast one of my top favorite people of all time in the entire world. Ouch. I was driving in the car today, and I'm like, oh, i got to ask him this question. Because, you know, I have this – I'm very partial to Michael Madsen. Anybody who knows me, and I know you haven't been friends with me long, but that's that's my big thing is Michael Madsen. He's like my top five actor teal. Like, you know how you've got your top five favorite? He's like in my top five period of everything. And I'm like – I'm always pointing out to people like, oh, I love how you book Michael Madsen. Or I'm like, oh, I see you didn't do with Michael Madsen. He is kind of cool. Just my thought. I'm just kind of throwing it out there in case you ever – Looking for an actor. Michael Madsen is very, very, very cool, and as well as his I love sister, him. Virginia, and I would love to. I know, I love her, her too. I know, right? Way, Virginia, That's what I'm talking his sister, about. His sister works on Star Trek, so there you go. <laughs> oh my God, how ironic is that, right? That's awesome. 
gosh. I, I, Look at that. It's all tied together to Star Trek somehow. It always ties together to Star Trek. But, yeah, I would love to work with Mr. Okay, Matthews. that's that's kind of that's kind of creepy for that whole Star Trek thing you got going on. But I'm going to leave you like that because, you know what, some people are just into that, and that's okay. I don't understand it, but we're all right. That's absolutely fine. Um, now, I want to read off a bunch of different ways to find you. When I get done, you can let me know if I've missed anything. I've tried really hard not to, but just listen to all this stuff, and then when I get done, you can correct me if I miss anything. Um, Russ's sure. website is obviously, as he mentioned, russem.com, the movie website being um, thatmovieshow.com. He has a profile on IMDb. He has a Facebook personal page, and his last name, by the way, folks, is Emmanuel, which is E-M-A-N-U-E-L. He also has a Facebook for TAA Movie. He's on YouTube. The Occupants website is OccupantsTheMovie.com. That's the film we've been talking about, folks. So anybody who's out in Pasadena, you can go to the International Film Festival and see it. Or check it out at the Russian International Horror Film Festival on March 20th through the 26th. Or at Toronto International Spring of Horror and Fantasy Film Festival from April 7th to 9th. Um, he's on Vimeo. He is on LinkedIn. And again, with the Facebook, we've got Chasing the Green. Uh, the Dollhouse, as well as the, um, is it the Collar movie? Did I get that correct? Yes. That's okay. Right. What am I missing? Because you're like everywhere. <laughs> uh, well, first, Got Movie Show is uh, Paul Hickman's um, show. Oh, so, um, I, I, I apologize. Right now, no, no, it, it's um, it's something I was interviewed by Paul. So, um, Got it. Yeah, shout out to Paul again. Okay. But, yeah, basically, yes, I won't make a note of that. Any, uh, if you want to see anything I've done, uh, just go to Russum. dot com. Um, the first the uh, first page, the okay. eight posters, and just click on any of those posters, or just go into the site itself, and basically you're able to see everything. So, yeah, you're right. I, I've done several films, and it's it's honestly it's 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 going to take forever to list them. But they're they're you know right. whether it's collar assassin. Princess and Saya, Go with Gun, Chasing the Green, um, you know, um, Restoration of Paradise, the documentary I did on the Bolsa Chica wetlands. Um, yeah, it's all there. I mean, just, um, just okay. please, um, if you're interested, please have a look. And um, yeah, please or contact me. Or go to the film me. festival. I'm, or find him, or come obviously, on Facebook yeah. and other places. Yes, that's that's exactly right. And I do hope you guys yeah. are going to make your way around to my film festival in June, because, you know, my festival is coming up in New York, and part of June or June 23rd, I had to think a minute, June 23rd to 25th, I'll be in New York City having my film festival. So Yay. you are more than welcome to come. Come to my festival, come and visit, see the films, be a panelist if you like. Oh, my God, I would love to have you on my director panel. That would be awesome. Huge directors, well, I call them huge in my own mind because they're fascinating and they're wonderful and they're the best in their craft. So I'd be more than happy to extend an invitation to you to come, especially if you're going to be in New York. You have to come. Um, come there with the film. Don't come there with the film. Just come to the panel. Come just to see whatever. I would absolutely love that because you're just you're, – you're very engaging and very enchanting and you're very easy to listen to. And I'm sure that my listening audience that comes to attend the festival would reap such a benefit from your knowledge. You wouldn't believe it. So definitely, please consider that, obviously. Um, Thank you. Without a doubt. And I'll, oh, of course. And I'll be watching your progress, obviously. Um, hopefully, I've done you justice outside of my – oh, I'm so mad at myself. I pride myself on doing such good work in journalism, and here I made all these mistakes today. See, I have to get off the cold medication, or like, don't do shows when you're sick. See, folks, this is what happens. I try to work when I'm sick. Now I have no voice either. <laughs> but I got the show in, so I'm like, okay, hopefully I did you justice. The show you did. You is did. archived. Thanks. You think? Oh, I hope so. Two hours, oh, no, and the sure. show will be archived. You you did oh, so I much research so. on me. Some, some some things I even forgot. <laughs> oh my god! Well, that's my job, dear. I'm supposed to do that, but no, <laughs> I I I just I get so frustrated with myself. You know how it is in your own occupation, because you like think to yourself, okay, I set myself at this bar, and then when something goes wrong, you're like, okay, just because I'm sick doesn't mean it should go wrong. You know what I'm saying? So you're like, you know what? It, it gets frustrating. So thank you for being such a good guest and and sharing your time with us and sharing your experience with us. I'll be watching you certainly and keep me posted about my festival, of course. And certainly the door is always open for you to come back. Anytime you want to promote something, please do come back and visit us again. I would love that. And now I'm going to go die before my voice goes because I can feel it going already. But I appreciate you taking the time. Please don't be a stranger though. I would love it to have you come back. Definitely one form or another, well, physical thanks, thanks. or radio or both. Thank you, Cindy. And uh, pl please get better. 
I'm going to try. I'm trying to rest, but it's hard. I have kids at home and a career. You know how this is, the rushing, rushing, rushing. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to silence today. I'm going to whisper all day and all night and tomorrow. <laughs> Hopefully tomorrow's show I'll get a little better. And I'm seeing a doctor tomorrow, so I may get some good antibiotic drugs. That will help. But thank you for the no. well wishes. I appreciate them. No, of course. Of I course. I, I felt bad that you were talking for so long. So, <laughs> well, so like, you'd be you. surprised. I can go up to two hours on the show. But, no, I wanted to do your proper justice, definitely. So thank you. And like you I did. said, two hours, it'll be archived. Stay in touch about the festival and let me know. And good luck. I'll be crossing my fingers for occupants for you, and especially for thank Assassin's you. Apprentice, too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy. All right, dear. Have a great afternoon. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Well, let's hope with any luck at all that, A, I don't sound as terrible as I feel right now. Oh, my God. And let's hope that you all forgot that I made a couple of mistakes. Oh, embarrassing, because we all know that I try so hard not to. Again, thank you so much to Russ Emanuel for his courtesy and for his patience and understanding. Thank you, folks, in, in my listening audience for actually listening to me when I sound like this. Oh, my gosh. Let me do the rundown again here for you. Uh, Russ Emanuel. Last name again spelled E M A N U E L. He's on Facebook and has a personal page, as well as his films, Occupants, Chasing the Green, The Collar Movie, and The Doll House. He's on YouTube, Vimeo, LinkedIn. He has an IMDb profile. The Occupants website is occupantsthemovie.com, and his actual website is Russ. Em.com. And I would suggest you go right to that website because, obviously, of course. That's where he's going to be listing all of his films and information and progress in terms of film festivals, places that you want to go to see his productions, etc. And last but not least, before I try to stop talking for a while, I do not want to be negligent and forget about seeing the one person who is completely responsible for this, which is, of course the lovely and wonderful Paul Hickman. If it wasn't for you, Paul, reaching out to me and saying, hey, I think you should interview this gentleman and talk about this project we did, he would have never made it on the show. So to you, my dear Paul, feel free to know that you are welcome on the show anytime and much appreciation for bringing him. He was an absolutely wonderful guest. One more time, I don't want to forget to remind everybody, Ignescent Music front lady Jennifer Benson is on the show tomorrow, 2 o'clock Central Standard Time. Thanks again to everybody for listening in. I need to go rest and take it easy before I hit my kiddos. Talk to you all tomorrow. Take care. Ready? Okay. We got paper. Yes, we do. Michael, notebooks, pencils, glue. We got crayons every hue. School supplies for your whole crew. Target's got everything you need to ready, set, go back to school. Ready? Okay. We got paper. Yes, we do. Michael, notebooks, pencils, glue. We got crayons every hue. School supplies for your whole crew. Target's got everything you need to ready, set, go back to school.